Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And today we're going to look at some Jamie Hewlett. I've been looking at his comics a lot lately for the stuff that I'm producing right now, just for the, f the spirit of, of his work. It's, it's fun. It's very kinetic. Um, every character he draws is unique and exciting to, to look at. So I don't have this. Uh, I probably do have it as of uh, this video going live. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I've been wanting to take a look into, the, in, in, into this book for a long time. Yeah, I've been a, a huge fan of his for a while. Whenever I did the first Street Angel series, all I heard about was Tank Girl, Tank Girl, Tank Girl. I hadn't really read Tank Girl at that point, so I waited until I was done. And since then, it's just become like this major influence. Not just Tank Girl, but all of Jamie Hewlett's stuff. Um, I would find his work in like Deadline Magazine. But as you say, Ed, very versatile in things like character design. Everybody probably knows Gorillas, which would be the thing. Tank Girl and Gorillas probably the two things he's most known for. And uh, really showcased his versatility as a multimedia artist, designer, animator, and uh, created the mascot for one of the Olympic Games. So he's huge. He's he's huge, and he's very broad in in the work that he does, where it appears, and the type of work that that he has done. Um, one of the early guys to bring things like animation and drawing combined with live action and 3D and stuff with the gorillas, or at least one of the guys to really do it on a high profile. So this is the Tashin uh, art book. You can see it's kind of a mm, inch and a half thick, pretty serious tome. I was so excited when this was announced as a big fan of his, so it did not disappoint. You know, Tashin, if you're familiar with them, they're an art book publisher, high production values, and I flagged a couple of things that we'll take a look at. They do a very good job of collecting things like sketches and blowing them up. I like seeing this kind of stuff. I'm always impressed. You talk about character design. This is where you can see it, where it's coming out of a sketchbook, and it's like, oh, man, that works at you know two or three times whatever the original drawing size was. This is another blown-up panel, and this is from a comic. If you look, it's like a little tiny spaceship, almost like, um, uh, what's inner space or something oh, like right, that, yeah. you know, where the spaceship's inside the body. You see the giant heart. Two-color looks great. So does he uh, annotate? A lot in this book? There's a little bit of text. There's not a lot. It's certainly not like page by page or anything like that, but they do a decent uh, job of organizing this and giving some, some background on what you're seeing. So like chapters are organized around things like Tank Girl or Gorillas or, you know, other projects, which helps. And then there'll be some context um, from him and from the writers of the book as to what you're seeing. And then these are different languages. So I think it's printed in like three different languages. Oh, which I have a couple art books like pretty, that too. Pretty common for Tash, and I think it's a way to, to make this stuff work. Yeah, I love seeing these giant images. Yeah, and talk about versatility. I mean, we're seeing stuff that is even uh, computer colored. So he wasn't a victim of attrition like many of the artists who who uh, refused to adapt to the new tools and technologies. Yeah, and one of the things that was great in like the Deadline magazines is he was always using different media. You would see things that were colored with markers. He was great in black and white. Things would be pencil drawings on top of like animation, cell, paint backgrounds multimedia collages um and so I, I flagged a few things just to kind of show off you know i think of him as a really great cartoonist in terms of like cartooniness absolutely uh whenever we would take a look at those deadline comics uh he, there would be just like whole bits of things going on in the margins that don't even have anything to do with the story but it's just like he can't help himself uh it's it's a different kind of graphomania because it's more idea based in a way like he sees a piece of white in the margin and he can't help but put something down on there. And usually it's more on, in the Aragones style of, of just like communicating like a, a quick thought rather than just, I don't know, drawing Gumby or something. It reminds me of some of the manga I see where there'll be like the uh, cartoony version of a character or the creator will be like in a corner of a panel, maybe at the end of the chapter right. or an opening of a chapter. I always think of like Ghost in the Shell. Yeah, Masamune Shiro like comes <clears throat> to mind. It's it's the same thing, man, where, uh, you know, like they'll just put something like, and then the characters go into a theater, but I didn't feel like drawing that part. Next page. By the way, these are blown up panels from Tank Girl, the Odyssey, which was like a nine panel grid with no gutters which is pretty pretty dense uh, Hewlett art if you're looking for it, and just, watercolor here. Yeah, just real quick, I uh, was watching some interviews with, with Hewlett sort of in preparation for this, and he was on the Jonathan Ross show. Jonathan Ross, the guy who did that In Search of Steve right. Ditko uh, documentary that's really great. Everybody should check it out on, on YouTube, and, you know, it's a three-part video. But uh, Hewlett's like, no, I don't really, like, fuck with anything right now in, in terms of comics, except 
you know, when Dan Klaus puts out something new or something. And and this this feels aligned like with a Klausian kind of aesthetic. And and this is definitely on paper, but the symmetry of the face is incredible. Like it's like, did he just draw half the face and then and then uh you know, light box it? Yeah, it's hard to tell. I'm I'm glad to hear the Dan Klaus comparison. I think there's some real similarities there. Um, Evan Dorkin was a guy who was in Deadline and I think knew Hewlett a little bit. You know, I think there's some com- comparisons between, say, that alternative art style and what he was doing, even though it's it's across the pond and, and coming from a little different background. But I think there's some similarities. I see a lot of Mike Mignola uh, crossover. And, you know, it's not as apparent on these pages, but we'll see some stuff, some skulls and things of that nature. So these are some comic book pages from a series he did called Freebies. It ran in the back of a music magazine. Here's the thing with Hewlett that's frustrating. He has so much stuff that is not easily available. So Freebies ran in the back of some music magazine. There's a Spanish collection of some of them, but not all of them. There's no English collection as far as I know. This book reprints a lot of them. So you get to see kind of this team. Um, It's mainly this character and this character. I, I don't even want to say solving crimes. Getting in trouble, fooling around getting in bar fights, things of that nature. But I love like the flat designs here and it shows off the, the uh, cartooniness of his character designs. This comes before Gorillaz. Yes. And, th- and this comes after the Tank Girl movie, which he cites is actually kind of hurting hurting his career. Uh, he had to, he approached that music magazine with this idea because he was getting no work. Like DC Comics kind of offered him jobs but you know this is a iconoclastic kind of creator like he will not be doing jobs you know uh so he he submitted this as an idea and he did it for a couple of years until uh the magazine just changed art director Mm -hmm. and didn't get along with them anymore yeah face magazine look at that great eyeball character face magazine is where these ran and then i believe there was like a pilot episode shot of uh foo action which i think is this character and I believe that floated around YouTube. I don't know if it's still online or not, but something to track down. Most of them were in color, and they were magic markers. So you can see an example here. The Spanish collection of these, it's all like this in color, and you see like the marker coloring, and it's just glorious. And then again, seeing his range as he gets super cartoony, very clean line here. A couple more examples of freebies. The reason I flag this is I think the coloring and lighting on this character is just, I, I'm st- I'll steal it. Anytime I can use this kind of coloring, it's so bold to have, you know, he's standing between them and entering this bar and that orange light is coming out of that, that interior bar scene. It's so thoughtful. And it's just like stunning, right? You've, yeah, because because like it's shorthand for stuff that we've experienced. It, like we'd know, like you've you've been in a situation where, where you, you saw this lighting, but in American comics, there would be like the harsh deviation right here. There would be like a black yeah. to kind of separate the light source from there with the light source coming from this era. And to just see it done with color is uh, that's a different approach. And he, and he does it. He does it well. It's great seeing his color work. It's it's very much has informed my approach to color. But doing it yourself, coloring yourself allows you to do this kind of drawing. You, you don't want to necessarily trust a colorist to, to, to understand the, the exact forms of, of where you want everything to go. All right. So getting into some gorillas, there's just an assortment of art. So like I just flagged some stuff that I think looks good. I don't know. This is a scene from the gorillas movie, which they didn't end up making, but I love it. Like all the characters are running around the hallway part, except this character who has jumped out the window and we see him tracking his dark silhouette in the foreground it's just great, right? I mean, it's it's visually, it reads, it's somewhat complex, four characters all running around, and yet it reads instantly and easily, and you see his use of collage in the background. So, like, he's constantly thinking on several levels, and I even love, like, the plants are even great. Yeah, I mean, this, this is what I'm in it for. Uh, this is what I've been pulling from his work for my own use. Um, nothing has to be boring right. on a comic page. And that's and that's what I get from his work. It's like, if you think you did it to the maximum, you could still push it more. And that's what I get from Jamie Hewlett's work. Yeah, and this spread, like you see so many things on display, shape, value, and color. 
I would say are all strong in this in this one image. And 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 storytelling, like this guy wants this fucker so bad that he's not even gonna deign to like he's gonna jump. You know, the quickest way from point A to B is a straight line. Yeah. Damn, damn a glass window or two. <laughs> it's. It, I mean, it's it's awesome. It it really is. I always, uh, when I was flagging these down, like several times, it would be like a couple pages before and after that were also exceptional. <laughs> I see some Mort Drucker in this and, and the, the, the previous piece, actually, because it was like kind of a Keith Richards ish looking thing. But like, I, these are Mort Drucker. Look at lines. how good he does noses, even, right? Like, these are three very distinct, four very distinct approaches to nose, and yet they're all cartoony and funny and distinct. It's, it's uh, Strong work. So here's a sketch, uh, like a composition sketch, something he submitted to Wired as a cover idea. I thought it was just cool to see, like, sketching. You know, you talk about, um, like, graphomania. That's my impression. It seems like he can draw very fast and draw very well, and a lot of that is on display. And it's nice because you get to see stuff that is very refined, but then you also, like, all of his charm comes through in a very quick very rough sketch he he does do a lot of drawing and in one of the interviews i was watching he he said that like he kind of like there's probably a year worth of stuff and maybe one of the interviews was in relation with this book so the stuff may be in here or not but he said he spent about a year just drawing pine trees is any of that in that here? is in here yeah 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 that is in here we'll get to that <laughs> <laughs> this reminded me of barry windsor smith weapon x that we talk about or at least I think about a lot. <laughs> the computer color is gorgeous. <laughs> he does really well with, with integrating computer and line work. And if you look closely, it's pencil line work. So, like, he's part of the reason I started using pencil more is because I would see the way he would use pencil and color and be like, okay, that's... I wouldn't think that would work, digital color with pencil, but it works perfectly. I think it's a softer edge. This is um, the storyboards from Rhinestone Eyes, which was a video that features the storyboards. That was probably one of the early things I came across where I was like, oh, I've got to study this guy. Because these things are monochromatic and they're gorgeous and they're the simplest drawings and the simplest coloring and yet astounding. And they're all reprinted in here. But you can also find that. We'll, we'll put a link to that below this video because it's it's amazing to see these things in color and whenever they switch from like the greens to the reds. It's still monochromatic, but it's a totally different mood. By the way, it's good comics right here. Oh, it's great comics. That's that's what impressed me. Like I always thought like you could make a limited animation this way. You know, when you see the video, you'll see what I mean. But it's just it's just beautiful and it's perfect. This was a sequence that I thought of as very uh Mignola esque, kind of the, the door blowing out. It's great, the guy walking through the smoke. Yeah, and it's like, you know, if you you can make the wrists skinnier always. And if you do, like give them a big like you just Oh, there's so much imagination and and you you see you see a, a place of um you know this guy comes from sesame street type type uh imagery uh hanna barbera i mean fireball is just wacky racers with with a fresh coat of paint on it yeah look at how great that is it's easy to be lost and you know like a lot of overwhelming drawings as we're flipping through quickly but i mean any of these just stand out you know pulling down the mask over his face some of the perspectives, like the aerial perspective of the dog fighting airplanes. Hard to do. Hard to do to make that look interesting. It used to be a mandate in DC Comics. No no dog fights. Well, he makes it look easy. And uh, this is, again, one of the things that was really has been really influential on me in the last 10 years is this video. And so to see the storyboards is pretty pretty good stuff. This is mainlining for me, dude. Like, like I cannot wait to freaking get back to the drawing table. It's incredible, and uh, I think I ran out of index cards at that point. Let's just go we'll go through stuff, a few man. of these just to see. And again, trying to figure out how do you integrate these cartoony designs with different video, different background images. He's He is not... Um, he seems bold and fearless in what he will combine and what he will try, which is something I would take away from this stuff, is like, go for it, and if it doesn't work perfectly, apply, you know do it better the next time and he he doesn't he doesn't stop uh innovating with like dude this is on a damn envelope this was done i'm gonna mess up the country he was sent to a country that was suffering climate issues like flooding their village this is bangladesh okay so i think this was like a, a village on the coast that was being pretty much wiped out from rising seas and monsoons and stuff and so he went there and he was drawing on like mail and envelopes and stuff that he could find there, stuff that he would find in the streets, like beat up pieces of paper. Some of it's drawn with like coffee and things. 
So again, showing his versatility, but it's almost like reporting or something that he was doing with this. And, you know, you can see some of these are really clear that he's just drawing on whatever found materials are available. Yeah, I recommend you check out his uh, his Instagram uh, page as well and, and see, like, the, the current kind of uh, evolution of his artwork. A lot of his work, too, if you look at it closely, it's relatively simple. Yeah. But it doesn't look simple whenever you're flipping through it. It's whenever you break it down and think, like, how is this done? And it's, like, two figures... Some collage reference. Yeah, here's the thing, though. It's it's incredible. It's simple in the amount of like lines that are put down, but he understands the volume of every single shape of every single muscle, and he doesn't have to like go Biasema over top of that or something, man. It's like you just get the shape and then tell the rest in color, and it just there's no faking. This is where you see the the fight between inkers and colorists often happens. And because I think he's doing it all himself, he can just defer to whichever side he feels is going to better express that form, that figure, that composition, whatever he's making. Because as you say, Ed, there's no extra, there's no wasted lines on this stuff. A lot of this is just an outline, and then all the form is put together through color that I assume he's doing, at least for most of this stuff. Speaking of color... This is some of those very simple character designs. Flat color background. This is all very all shapes. All shapes, yeah. And works great, big. I thought this is a pretty nice image. Very different than his normal style. Looks like he's using a brush pen or some kind of, I don't know, less, you know, not a pen there to make those lines. Although for all I know, it's a digital drawing. <laughs> Who knows what any of this stuff is. Great color. Look at that underlighting. Oh, totally. Some of the material that's in here is um, projects that never went to publication, um, projects that were done as like spot illustrations. These pages are from a picture book, you know, like a kid's book that uh, I guess he didn't sell or didn't, you know, didn't find a deal that he was happy with, but shows the versatility, right? Like, what a range. Yeah, and uh, down to, like, all the production details of, you know, co like, composing. Like, the, at the Kubert School, they would, they would grade you on your cleanliness of your production package. Interesting. And this is, uh, you know, professionally done. Robots in pajamas. <laughs> I don't know what this was for. But this is, I can see a lot of Mike Mignola in this kind of stuff. It's interesting to see like the little bits of overlap between him and some of the cartoonists that we're more familiar with or, or more mainstream type cartoonists. That's really fun too, seeing all the noodling. This was a, a newspaper, I guess a proposed newspaper strip. And we're going to see a few more of these in another book that we're going to show in a minute. But must work all the time when it comes to to, to his tenure as a as a cartoonist uh, from the interviews that he gave surrounding this book he is kind of a casualty of the European invasion uh, because the the British scene went away uh, when right. Gaiman and all those guys came to town and uh, and he he just had no opportunity out there uh, to do much comic work. The name of this piece, and I guess it's just a standalone drawing painting, dropped my SUV keys. Oh, so cheeky. <laughs> it's such a strange image, though, with like this tree that just doesn't, doesn't quite fit. A little Sid Vicious-inspired piece there. So. I want to see some of the pine trees before we go. Okay, yeah. The pine trees are part of an art show. There, there were three parts. It was in London... Chris Pitzer from Ad House Books went, and mm -hmm. so he brought me home the, the program and a coaster, which I still use, which is surprisingly an awesome, at least in my house, I use it a lot. Um, but it was one part, these uh, cards, the tarot cards set, and then it was one part, the trees, which we'll get to, and one part, these photo, like, movie posters. These are pretty nice. Yeah, gorgeous. So a set of those, and then they cover each one. Honey is the name of the posters that I'm talking about. And they're like these adult posters, like a 70s homage kind of thing. So I, I assume playing with photography, design, typography. And 
and then the pine trees. And the pine trees look like just studies and, you know, like drawing studies. I don't know how big these were. I don't know if there's a measurement somewhere for the scale he's working on these. But I'd be curious about that. Like, I could imagine if these are pretty large, they would be impressive in person. Amazing textures here. Yeah, it seems like texture and value is probably what he was getting out of it. And, and probably the forms, too, that organic form of the limbs. I always think of this stuff as like fractal design. Sure. Oh, yeah, totally. And 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 that that could become a very dicey proposition as a, as a cartoonist if you start going down the fractal rabbit hole too much. I think of the fractal stuff with everything though. Um, whenever it comes to like writing, it's sort of like every part of a of a story is is fractal like that. Like a scene has a beginning, middle, and end. The story has a beginning, middle, and end. The acts have their beginning, middle, and ends. Pages have it. You know, it's almost like you're just repeating the same concepts. You want questions to come out. You want to propel the thing forward when uh when when scanning some printed uh x-men grand design stuff for hip-hop family tree and you realize that the dots of the ben day are put down on that paper with dots that's when shit gets a little crazy like when you yeah, scan right, that yeah, in yeah. and you see dots making that's up fun. the dots, dots, and on it's dots. Like, oh, no, <laughs> i'm going crazy like the guy in the movie pie so this is a sketchbook section at the back that's on this translucent paper i don't know if he's drawing on vellum if that's the idea that this is you know, reproducing that in some way. Look at those. Like comic strip roughs. Pretty neat. You get to see the more refined drawing, you know, rough sketch, and then break out the refined drawings and assemble digitally at some point. It's so good. Yeah. Just throw away stuff and it's so strong. So... Amazing book. I would highly recommend it. I'm thrilled with it. Like I said, we, we really just skimmed the surface on that, you know, by flagging a few pieces and kind of flipping through quickly. There's a lot to take in on a book like this. And I believe they've gone into a second print. So it's still available at, at a, you know, cover price if you want to track that down. And then the other Hewlett art book that I, that I brought is Cream of Tank Girl. There's lots of Tank Girl reprints and stuff out there. This one shows a lot of his process stuff. It shows some art scanned in four color, almost like an artist edition. It shows ephemera, you know, things like zines. Like, I think that's pretty striking and engaging in a very early piece of his work. This is well annotated. So whatever you're looking at in here, if you have a question about what it is, where it came from, uh, you can find those answers um, I think it's a pretty standout book for like an art book. Yeah, that's cool. So this is like probably where you uh, had had uh, beyond the beyond the shadow of a doubt that some of this stuff was done with um, just markers. Yeah, and you that. can really see it. And so this section that I'm flipping through, I flag because it shows some of his color work. It's so incredible to think of like you would have been getting this in the early '90s. You know, think of like a Marvel comic. You're just talking about the dots and the Bende dots. Like that's what what was still happening then you know and so like he's airbrushing and painting and using markers and pasting things up and collaging radical man compared to like your average marvel comic from 19 this is probably 1992 1991 something this is that uh animation cell so drawing on animation cell and then painting on the back and I was that's thinking, where you get those flat colors yeah i was thinking about doing some of that stuff it's he's great because he is so experimental. Like you get to see all those techniques and see how they look and everything. This was storyboards for, I don't know if it was a tank girl comic or I mean cartoon or what, but showcasing it because it's just a great, great example of his cartooning. I don't even know what this was for exactly. It didn't go anywhere, but it's beautiful. Tank girl package art. So weird. These were the original tank girl magazines. Yeah. I've never seen those. I picked up a couple of odds. Great layouts. You get to see the finished printed cover final and then his process. Of That's like awesome. I, I breaking those shit. down, experimenting with color. I always like whenever you see like the, the quick color studies that people would do in some of their sketchbooks, but you get to see that even like the different, trying different pinks and stuff. Pretty cool. There's a lot in here too. This is very reminiscent of the of the Tashin book because there's just so much material that they bring out. You know, scripts, cover art before it's actually yeah. I'm picking this up. Trade dressed sketchbooks. Um, it's kind of all over the place. And this one, I believe, they switch places in in uh, 
Martin draws this, I believe, <laughs> is the breakdown. But there's there's a variety of uh, material in here, and one of my favorite, you know, art books from a comic comic book artist. Such a pleasure to go through this stuff, Jim. Thanks for thanks for uh, pulling it off the shelves. Oh, here's that syndicated strip that I mentioned. We'd see a little bit more of. This gives you some background of, as you say, the Tank Girl movie was kind of this big thing, and trying to like figure out where you go from there. <laughs> I think some of this work is an example of that. Just trying to wrestle with that, but you get to see his like precision pencils. Yeah, and, and I was just seeing like how he lays down his lettering guys. He he does it in the same way that Jaime Hernandez does, where you just like you just have that baseline. baseline. Yeah. So such a pleasure. Please everybody, man, go look at Jamie Hewlett. Uh, I wish he was I wish more of his stuff was in print. You know, it kills me that there are significant chunks of his art that you really have to work to track down one page at a time or, or one section at a time in some of the deadline magazines. So publishers out there, Jamie Hewlett, come on, man. Invest in the guy. Help me out a little bit. <laughs> Put some of these collections out that I need desperately. Yeah, man. You guys have Jim freaking uh, cut magazines apart and hard binding his own <laughs> comics. <laughs> Don't make me buy my own Jamie Hewlett books. <laughs> Let's get the heck out of here, Jimmy, man. I, I, I'm, I'm jazzed up to get back to drawing. Yeah, this is this is fuel for my art fire, absolutely. Kayfabers, like, subscribe, and follow the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon, and we'll let you know whenever we have new vi videos available. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe merch at our spread shop. Link below the video to that. I'm going on eBay right now. I'm buying these books, man. Give them the marching orders, Jimmy. Read more Jamie Hewlett comics. <laughs>